Okay, good day, everybody. Welcome back to our webinar series. Um, today we have Paul Harris from IO Utilities in Australia. And Paul's going to be presenting on a leakage management benchmarking program that was undertaken in 2020. So please go ahead, Paul. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you all for joining in tonight. Uh, firstly, uh, I'd just like to give you a quick overview of what I'll talk about tonight, a very brief introduction to oil utilities. I'll take you through the 2020 leakage management program that we ran and the key findings, and then finalise the session with some questions later on. In terms of who I am, uh, I've, I've actually had a 20 year, 25 year history in management consulting, very deep process and metric benchmarking in the water and energy industries for a number of programs for the International Water Association and Water Services Association of Australia in areas such as civil operations and maintenance, mecha operations and maintenance, customer service and asset management. And I was actually the program director for IELTS 2020 Leakage Management Benchmarking Program. Who are IELTS? Uh, for those of you who do, do not know who IELTS Utilities actually is, well, we're basically a technology identification company. Um, I think in the last uh, few years since our being formed, we've identified something like 6,000 technologies and 200 of those have been commercialised and over a billion dollars of investment. We, we don't uh, support individual uh, brands in terms of technology producers. We, we support the technology and what it's achieving. I, I'm actually heading up our business consulting practice as a business consulting arm of all utilities, which is predominantly focused on technolo technology and innovation, and I focus on business consulting have a global print, footprint, uh, offices in the UK, Germany, Italy. We've got Marco with us today who heads up our Italian office. We've got offices in Australia and throughout the US and a number of uh, utility and technology type clients. I think at last count about 85 to 90 employees. Okay, what was the program? Well, the program, actually was run over a period of March through to September last year and involved a number of key participants, uh, involved seven UK businesses, which included big, big, big businesses like Thames Water, Yorkshire Water and United Utilities. It also included some big players in Australia, Sydney Water, uh, SA Water, uh, Urban Utilities and Hunter Water and City West Water. And we also had a business from Brazil in Aegea who are actually based in Sao Paulo. So a predominantly Australian and UK peer group and most of the findings or key themes I'll present tonight are from the perspective of UK versus Australia. What was the study about? Well, it had four key elements or deliverables which I'll take you through yeah, step by step. Firstly, a focus on the non-revenue water balance and the calculation in terms of how that was being conducted throughout the world. And we did some benchmarking around the individual components of that. We did some analysis on the four leakage management pillars, those being pressure management, active leakage control, speed and quality of repairs and asset management, and compared those across the businesses. That gave us through those first two deliverables over 35 leading practices that we could share uh, across the peer group. And the program culminated in an industry best practice workshop where those that had best practices presented those practices. Now in relation to the first area, which is non-revenue water balance, what we are interested here in was primarily uh, what businesses were doing around the world, whether they were using the IWI assumptions or whether they were doing bottom-up calculations. We also measured uh, the infrastructure leakage index. And we also looked a little bit at pricing because pricing can in a way influence leakage. I'll talk about that later. 
In the space of unbuilt authorised consumption, we looked at op obviously operational use and mange flushing techniques. In apparent losses, we collected information on theft, meter penetration, meter technology type, meter inaccuracies and data handling. And in the space of real losses, that was all about trying to understand whether or not businesses could actually quantify their, their losses by individual asset classes, i.e. storage, transmission, distribution, and service connections. What we found with this actually was quite interesting. So completely and utterly varying levels of confidence in the calculation of non-revenue water. Um, particularly in components like unbuilt authorised consumption and unauthorised consumption. And the Australian businesses predominantly were adopting the IWA assumptions, whereas the UK, because they've been pushed by Ofwat by their recent performance and reward process for reporting of leakage, they were really trying to move towards bottom up because they have to give financial guarantees on the amount of losses or leaks per year. We've also found varying levels of confidence in the apportioning of real losses across asset classes. So some businesses were using the Bay model and some weren't, but in general, there was quite a challenge for businesses to actually define what their losses were in each part of their asset base or across those classes. And a big observation was that there wasn't a lot of real-time monitoring um, most of the businesses were using technology in a fragmented form in terms of in pockets of their business and doing sometimes sophisticated or less sophisticated analysis, but generally not elevating that up to a holistic or real-time level at a network level. Generally, very bespoke uh, technology, uh, if you like, adaptations to calculation of loss across their network. This is the sort of outputs that we got, which were interesting because what it showed, um, what I can reveal, all of these businesses uh, were given a key, A through to M. So these are water participants, A through to M, all blind coded in both of these charts. And what you can see here is, I can tell you most of the Australian businesses were down the left-hand end and they were adopting IWA assumptions around un, unauthor, or unbuilt, unmetered, authorised consumption. Whereas the UK, as I said earlier, because they were moving towards this off what reporting regime, there was greater propensity for them to actually calculate what, they would, what their mains flushing and firefighting flows were and get an absolute value for that. So that was an interesting outcome. And a lot of them are working a lot more closely with their local fire authorities to do that sort of work or working closely with their operational teams to monitor flows during um, in-plant cleaning processes or mains flushing. Theft was also interesting. So the IWA assumption is 0.1% uh, of system input. And a lot of the Australians were using that as a default figure. Whereas the ones in the, over on the right here, the UK that had done it, they were finding that the theft figure was in fact much, much bigger than what the IWA assumptions were, significantly bigger. And no real processes for actually managing theft around uh, void and vacancy on site. So that was a real challenge to them. But what it did show is that this is probably an unknown area of the calculation around theft because a lot of them, uh, as I say, we're adopting IWA assumptions, whereas those that weren't were finding some pretty significant theft flows. Real losses was interesting. Um, so this is the ILI for the peer group going from A again across to M. So most of the Australian businesses are around an ILI of one and the UK businesses and the business out of Brazil were basically one and a half and upwards. So some big infrastructure leakage index figures. What you'll notice here is we actually, we, we calculated some losses according to per thousand connections in the UK and Australia. And the UK is about two times the leakage of the peer group of Australians. Now this is 
due to a number of factors, but primarily what we found, it came down to the type of material and age, and I'll talk about this at the, at the end of the presentation, but also uh, their propensity to invest in water main renewal. Uh, in Australia, we, we were investing more heavily in asset replacement than the UK, and we felt that this was having a big impact on our loss performance. What I will say, if you look at this chart on face value, you'd say, gee, there's no learnings for the Australians in this program, but that was actually false. What we found when we got to the pillars, which I'll talk about now, is that the UK were doing some really, really good things in certain pillars of leakage management. So if we move towards that, what did we analyze there? So what we did was we, we tried to where we could get some cost figures. So what were they spending on pressure management, active leakage control, speed and quality of repairs and asset management, and tried to break that down on by per pillar and by connection or property. And we also looked at CapEx. We looked at re retail pricing. In the case of pressure management, we got figures on pressure differentials for different networks. We got figures on PRV and DMA density. We looked at technologies. We looked at inspection rates. Inactive leakage control, a lot of our focus was on what techniques and technologies were being adopted across the peer group and how that translated to leakage events. And obviously, one of the big things in Australia compared to the UK is we, we use customers pretty heavily for leakage reporting. Speed and quality of repairs was reasonably focused on the response time and the repair time. And there were some interesting observations there. And in the space of asset management, it was predominantly about age material of assets, particularly in across transmission distribution and service connections and relating that to even, as I said earlier, some distribution mains replacement rates. So it was quite a deep dive into these pillars in terms of their contribution to leakage. One of the things we found and turning to the first pillar, which is pressure management, is the UK have been doing this very, very well for 10 or 15 years compared to the Australians, which are really at the only at the beginning of the pressure management process. So the UK had much greater densities of PRVs and DMAs and were managing, if you like, part, discrete parts of their networks as, as distribution zones. Whereas in Australia, there wasn't a high prevalence of PRVs or DMAs, not yet. And the other thing that stood out was that the UK were using much more advanced technology in this space than the Australians. Now, if I go over to a chart here, it really stood out when we charted PRV and DMA density uh, across the peer group. And what you'll notice here is nearly all of the Australians are down here at low PRV and low DMA density. As I said, it's not actually a thing that's done uh, much within Australia at this point in time. However, in the UK, as you can see here, bigger pressure, pressure differentials, which is indicated by the size of the bubble, and therefore leading to higher PRV and higher DMA density. The other thing that supported this, obviously, was a lot more spending on this in the last, over the last 10 to 15 years. So this was a big learning, actually, for the Australian contingent. In the case of technology, that also provided a really interesting observation. So the Australians predominantly use a lot of uh, flow control or fixed outlet technology in the, in the case of PRVs and very, very low levels of technology. We've still got operators running around in the middle of the night and adjusting pressure reducing valves for certain zones that are required to have pressure reduction overnight. Whereas in the UK, much higher levels of technology uh, and use of advanced control and pressure management systems that were remotely controlled. That, in, that meant that they were better 
better able to deal with bigger pressures. They were better able to deal with fire flows if they had them. And they were also in a position where they probably had a much closer uh, relationship be between knowing what pressure management results gave them in terms of losses compared to the Australians who are only beginning to go down that path. So that was a big difference in the way that the way they approached it. Now, we also got a similar observation with active leakage control. So I'll just talk to this. So in Australia, our metre penetration rate's about 95 to 100%. In the UK, it's barely 50. There are some businesses that have 90% penetration. They weren't in, the, in this study. Businesses like Southeast Water in the UK but most of them had very, very low penetration. And they also had, if they had AMR, it wasn't really switched on. It was basically providing one or two data points every quarter. So it wasn't being used as typical smart metering. We've got uh, a mixture of accumulation meters and digital meters, but our meter gives us an immediate relationship with our customer because our customer has to talk to businesses in Australia about water price, water quality, service reliability, and what they're paying for. And that's all detailed out on their water bill, including their consumption. So we found we've got much higher levels of customer engagement and reporting of leaks. What the UK did very well is they've got a much higher propensity to use leakage detection teams. They had a lot of teams running around with handheld technology, but also they were implementing vast quantities of acoustic sensors into their network. So one of, the, one of the examples I can give you is that we've got businesses here in Australia that are experimenting with 500 to 1,000 sensors, if you like, in a central business district. In the UK, particularly businesses like United Utilities, they're implementing 40,000, 50,000 loggers, orders of magnitude much greater than Australia. Now, what I need to say here for clarification, pressure management and active leakage control is all about sweating the assets. It may allow you to extend the life by a few years, but it doesn't necessarily present, uh, prevent major failures which will occur in the future. So there's a huge difference between sweating the asset using pressure management, active leakage control versus what I'll talk about later in asset management where you're doing asset replacement. So the UK is very, very focused on sweating the assets and that's because of their private ownership and board direction. Okay, so that came out in our results. So in the space of customer reporting, what I will say is, as you can see there, the Australians have got a really, we've got a very spiritual connection to our water. Customers are, have got a very low tolerance for seeing a leak in a street or generally leaks in their household or water being used incorrectly, such as sprinklers being left run. So we've got a community that's really ripe for engaging in the customer or in the leakage process. So most of the Australians have leakage management water conservation programs, which engage with them and get them incentivized to be part of our leakage management process. And that's showed here. In the UK, and particularly Ireland, Northern Ireland Water said they barely get reporting of leaks through their customers. They're not interested. And there could be various reasons for that, soil types, et cetera. But we've got a much higher level of customer engagement in leakage and therefore reporting. The big difference, however, again, in this was in technology. So if you look at these charts here across these different asset classes, what you'll see is that in the middle here of the UK and on the end of the Australians, the Australians are using, as I said earlier, lots of customers to report their leaks. In the UK, they're using all sorts of acoustic technology and other technologies to basically assist with their leakage program. Minimum night flow analysis was another one. So again, much more commitment to the technology 
than the Australians. And as I said earlier, because they are focused on sweating the assets and looking at low cost or lower cost options than replacement to do that. So these were two areas where the UK were doing wonderful things and the Australians were quite a fair way behind. Now, when we get to speed and quality of repairs as another, as the third pillar, I think it's fair to say that the UK and the Australians are very, very, and less so in Brazil actually, but very highly regulated. So this is an important area around how you tend to leaks. But the difference in Australia is with the way that we've had to deal with drought is a lot of our leakage work was 15 years ago was prioritised very low. Now it's given a priority one. So any minor leak and obviously massive bursts are almost treated as emergency and dealt with straight away. And that's basically because of government and community pressure. So we've got a different approach to the way we go about repairing leaks than the UK. And we've supported that with some quite sophisticated contracting frameworks where contractors are incentivized to get to those leaks quickly and repair them. The big thing in the UK that we found was that there's much higher levels of bureaucrat bureaucracy, particularly around accessing assets in, in London. And that meant that there were longer delays around waiting for access to assets, getting access to assets under critical assets like major roads and highways than we have here typically in Australia. Now, this is not a strong, it, it looks like a strong correlation, but I, I think we need to be careful. But this is ILI product plotted from left to right. And this is speed of response and repairs for distribution mains and service connections charted. And what you'll see is that generally the lower response and repair times, which the Australians were delivering over here on the left, was contributing, I'm not saying fully, but in part, to lower infrastructure leakage index figures. And as I said, the UK, one of the big learnings for them from Australia was that they needed to think carefully about how they communicated to their regulators and their owners around managing leakage, that it had to be reprioritised, it had to be pushed up to their uh, much higher levels of priority in their work programs, particularly around emergency work, and that they felt was going to be a trigger to perhaps break down some of the bureaucratic challenges they find around accessing assets. So as I say, we've had a lot of support from community and government to change our repair and response regime in Australia and give this absolute utmost importance, even in critical assets within the central business districts of most of our cities. So this is an, was an important finding. Now, if I turn to the last theme, asset management, this provided some really interesting themes as well. So you would all understand that the Australian uh, networks are younger and we generally had, if you like, much more modern materials than the UK. And this is a significant driver we felt in loss performance actually, because it's something as I said earlier, pressure management and leakage, man uh, leakage, active leakage control allow you to sweat the assets. But if you're stuck with cast iron pipes that are 80 years old, you're stuck with cast iron pipes that are 80 years old. You can't do nothing about that unless you renew them and replace them. So that was, this was a big factor in the success of asset management and the way it was being applied. Across the board, very, very little information known about service connections. This is the piece from the main into the house. Most businesses didn't have any information on age or material. And this was quite distressing because one of the bottom up pieces of analysis that people have done around their non-revenue water balance showed that 50% of your real losses can just be in this service connection piece between the main and the house. And yet, there's very little known about these assets. The other key observation here was that the Australian businesses are spending quite a bit more money on mains renewals than the, their UK cohorts and similarly also than their Brazilian cohorts. 
Now, if you have a look at this chart here, this is age. This, this starts to show you the disadvantages that the UK industry are facing relative to younger uh, networks such as we see here in Australia. So you can see here in transmission and distribution that the, the proportion of cast iron is about 25%. Oh, sorry, the age, sorry, is around over 80 years. Whereas in Australia, it was only 10% 10, 10 of our network was in fact over 80 years old. So this was a big driver and this was a real revelation to the UK businesses because they said we always knew that was probably the case, but they now had some more emphatic information to talk to their regulator with, with regard to age profile. The other thing that stood out was, as I mentioned earlier, this area of black is unknown. The proportion of service connection age that was unknown across the peer group, quite significant, very significant if in the context of looking at our study. And as I said earlier, there were businesses that, was, that were really struggling to get that information. So some businesses now will do a main repair and they'll make a compulsory part of that main repair will be to do an inspection of, a, of a attached uh, service connections. One, to assess condition. Two, to assess material. And three, to where they can assess age. Now, if we turn to materials, we got the same result. Um, we, we saw a lot of cast iron being used in the UK in transmission in their distribution networks compared to Australia. And this, is, this again started to highlight to us that these are factors that are in a sense uncontrollable to the UK. And they know this, but this data started to provide them with a little bit more evidence around what their profile of network looks like from a material and age perspective compared to others and start to think more carefully about how they justify either repair programs or replacement programs. Again, as I said earlier, if you look at this service connection piece, it had a lot of black areas in there for unknown uh, information around pipe material. So we were, we found this was an interesting part of the analysis actually, because where most real losses are probably occurring, there's very little known about those assets. This chart provided an interesting outcome. So what we did was we asked the businesses to assign what they were spending on leakage across the four pillars, pressure management, active leakage control, speed and quality of repairs and asset management. And there was a stark difference. So all of these businesses on the left hand again are Australian businesses and they were spending two, three, four, five times more money per connection on mains replacement than the UK. Now there's various reasons for that. Um, this is where water pricing is critical. So our bulk water pricing and our retail pricing tends to be a bit higher than the UK on a cost per litre. So what that meant is we have slightly higher discretionary funds for these sorts of activities than perhaps the UK. So that was one factor. Uh, we have a really engaged community. We have a really engaged regulator and we have a really engaged board when it comes to leakage. And there's various models that we use here in Australia that allow us to predict uh, failure, but more importantly, to make a judgment call on when a main water main needs to be replaced. So generally there's a number of breaks per length rule, and then there's a whole number of other parameters. So our modeling is quite sophisticated, but more importantly, it's supported by available funds and also, as I said, stakeholders who endorse this. Whereas I think in the UK, they're fighting against stakeholder endorsement for water main renewal, and they're also fighting against discretionary funds. What I will say is two of the businesses took this information from asset management and took it into a regulatory process in the UK and use this information quite successfully to argue with their regulator 
that they needed more money, more capex to spend on mains replacement. And that was a result we didn't expect, but two of the businesses got an astounding result from that process. So probably the most interesting, some of the most interesting findings in the study were within this asset management pillar. A key output was leading practices compendium. So as we went around all of these businesses, we spent quite a bit of time on their site in interviewing them around what they did in two areas, around non-revenue water balance and around these four pillars of leakage management. And it was just wonderful because what it did was it brought to light some of the really good things that businesses are doing in regards to leakage management and some of the practices they're adopting. And so we created this 40 odd page compendium, which contained all of these leading practices. And the way they were written up was like this example here. They were, there was a, a bit of background to the actual, the actual practice. We, we, we spoke about benefits. Some of these benefits were, we were able to quantify in terms of loss performance. And we're also able to give them some guidance on the considerations around implementation of that particular practice. Every single practice, and I haven't included it here, was also accompanied with a contact name, an email address. So every single business that uh, was, was provided with this compendium could make contact with that business and that person who provided that leading practice to learn more about it. The way that we wrote the improvement initiatives up for each business is that we pointed directly to these practices. So when we assess their non-revenue water balance and we assess their leakage pillar performance, where we saw gaps in performance, we basically pointed them directly to certain best practices for improvement. And that was great because it created some information sharing across the businesses beyond the end of the study. And as I said earlier, what, what actually came out of the study was good in the sense that we had some great leading practices in the UK around pressure management, active leakage control. And we also had some great practices coming out of Australia in relation to speed and quality of repairs and also in relation to asset management. The study culminated actually in the delivery of a best practice workshop. So that was run primarily, uh, we ran that at a, a time that suited both the UK and Australia. So it was summertime in the UK. We ran it at about 7.30 in the morning for them or eight o'clock. And it was about five o'clock here in the afternoon in Australia. And that worked wonderfully well. Now, originally, what we wanted to do was a face-to-face -face best, best practice workshop and run one in London and one in Sydney here in Australia. But we weren't able to do that with COVID. We ended up having to run a video teleconference, but that actually ended up being an advantage because it meant that people didn't have to travel to the conference. They could dial in by a web link we, we ran the best practice workshop over three nights. So it's about two and a half hours each. And each night had a different theme. And we had different presenters from Australia and the UK and Brazil presenting their different leading practices on a fixed theme. So that created lots of great learnings across the different uh, industries. And as you know, I've, there'd be, plenty of people on this webinar tonight that know that information sharing across jurisdictions is really difficult in real time and even in, in not real time, if you like. So this was a perfect opportunity to get everyone in the same virtual room at the same time and talk about leakage. And it created really good discussion around the best practices. We ran also some breakout sessions that meant that they could break off out of the presentations and they could meet and discuss the way they were approaching certain things around leakage. So this was an important part of the process. It created networks 
Um, what we are working on now as a result of this is creating a working group that has a, has a cross reference of people from Australia, the UK and notionally South America with a view to them continuing to share ideas around practices and techniques that they're adopting in leakage management. One of the important things was getting the industry to agree to certain things they needed to focus on and we were able to do that. So certainly there was a technology theme and one of the main themes coming out of the industry workshop actually was the need to move to a more real-time system around putting sensors throughout the network, pressure, acoustic flow, rolling that up into data science and data analytics and using that for much more predictive leakage management and leakage monitoring. So that was certainly one of the key outcomes that we took from the study. I'll summarise this by saying we're running the same study again in 2021. It'll mean that we'll get a whole lot of data points added to the charts that I've shown you. So instead of going from A to M, it'll go from A to Z and beyond that. So we'll end up with hopefully 25 to 30 data points in each area of analysis. We hope to also learn some new practices and we also hope that uh, we'll get uh, some, some new networking and new people involved in our, in our push to create much better leakage management around the world. That's all I'd like to say for my presentation and uh, I'd like to hand over to questions if I can, please. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. That was um, very good. And we do have quite a few questions already, but um, if anybody else has any questions for Paul, they can uh, put them into the chat function at the bottom of your, of your screens. Um, the first question we've got is from Joe and Joe's, Joe's talking about um, the impact of weather. And she said the impact of weather on customer reported leaks has been clearly shown in a UK WIR project, which was completed last year. In Australia, the weather will facilitate customer reporting of leaks. So I don't know whether you looked at it, whether that was considered. Um, it, it came back, uh, Joe, from the Irish particularly, who said we have a lot of wet weather. So it's, it's very difficult for our community to walk out the front and see a leak in the street. So that, that, that was definitely a consideration. We didn't adjust for that in the study, but it was noted. Uh, what I will say though, a lot of the customer initiatives here in Australia are, about not, are not so much about getting customers to walk outside and look for leaks, although they will if they're, if they're asked to, if they see a leak or report it. It's more about them critically analysing their bill and looking closely at household usage and how it varies and therefore if they see usage climbing up above where it should be, being proactive, getting in touch with their water utility and saying, I think I might have a leak. Can you come out and check whether it's my responsibility or, or your responsibility? But your point around weather is duly noted. Um, we've got another question from Brian and, and this, this comes from uh, uh, around the mains renewal. Uh, obviously, in Australia, they were doing more in terms of money-wise, but he's, he's asked, can you provide an idea of mains renewal percentage in Australia? So I guess he means percentage of their actual uh, mains. I could. I had, don't have that figure available right now, but we ended up, Brian, uh, we represented it by kilometres of renewal per property, but I could probably do it in a you're asking as a uh, percentage of their network. I can, I can find that out for you. Uh, another question from Joe. Uh, did you investigate how many of the organizations had developed asset deterioration models, which were used for prioritization of mains renewals? In the UK, these tend to show that oldest cohorts do not necessarily provide the greatest failures. Yeah, look, I think, Joe, that's a really good point. The, 
uh, you can have an 80 year old pipe, pipe cast iron pipe in one part of the network that's in reasonable condition and in another part of the network it's in horrible condition it's under different operating conditions different pressures different flows it has different soil conditions perhaps slightly different climatic conditions uh, the modeling here what the aussies will tend to do is they'll do quite as many inspections as they can where they're doing uh, mains repairs and they'll document condition and material type they'll then roll that up into a, a network level and see if there's every any correlation or consistent themes around age and material across the entire network where they can um, however one of the challenges you have there obviously is then allowing for these different conditions that are occurring in the network and criticalities as well where you've got different customers in the in certain parts of the network such as politicians sporting arenas etc which can place a higher priority on asset replacement than necessarily condition so my short answer is they were, they were certainly looking at condition, but they were also looking at a whole lot of other parameters around asset replacement. And it was well known across the peer group that depending on what part of the network you were in, you got different performance being realized by exactly the same pipe material and age. Okay. Uh, we've got a question from Mordecai, which is, have you investigated the impact of AMI on water loss management? It's a really, really good question, actually. Uh, the, uh, um, the UK, I was surprised, as I said earlier, are only at the AMR stage, and I was hoping to get a few learnings there, given the fact they're highly into tech, but we didn't. In Australia, we're really still only at the trialing level with AMI. So some of the results around leakage impact through increased reporting I've, have not yet been tested, not fully. They're only still within a trial stage here, in, certainly in Australia. The hypothesis is that if you can provide more granular information around daily use and seasonal use, you can therefore perhaps promote a, a, a customer being much more proactive with regard to leakage observation and reporting. However, that evidence is yet to be proven. Okay. Um, we've got a question. I think it's a couple of questions from Addy, which is how many people do the utilities you survey the servicing? So I think that means how many connections, connections were there, yeah. connections for each utility, mm -hmm. and uh, and do they have hilly territory? So uh, yeah. what's the? So we would have probably our smallest business, Addy, was one hundred and fifty thousand connections. A business here in Australia had two hundred thousand connections, and our biggest business in Australia would be one point two to three million. One point two to two million connections. In the UK, they're much bigger than that. Thames Water would have two and a half million connections or two to two and a half million connections, I'd imagine. So it, it did vary, as I say, all the way down from 200,000 connections up to two million connections. Um, a question from Azim, which is, what was the percentage of smart meters in the various utilities and what was the impact on overall reduction in non-revenue water? Mm. Very, very low, as I said earlier. Um, the rollout of digital meters here in Australia is now beginning in earnest. So if you ask me that question in two years, I'll probably happily be able to say that 30 to 40% of businesses networks here are now supported by Amy at the moment be less than two or three percent. In the UK, as I said earlier, there were businesses using AMR rather than accumulation meters, even though they've got a limited meter rollout, but they weren't using it like a smart meter. They were basically pulling a data point off that meter once every few months. So it wasn't adding any benefit as a as a as a smart meter. And uh, we've got one final question, which is from Michael, which is, did you compare cost of asset renewal 
And is asset renewal more expensive in the UK? Is that a factor to why there are different renewal rates? And if so, how big a factor do you think it is? Um, we didn't compare the costs and there's various reasons why. Even, even a job within the same business could vary. So depending on material type, it could it, soil type, depth, the geography, there's a whole lot of things that actually would drive some significant variances in cost. With regard to the latter part of your question, I would expect that in a very dense city like London, it would be more expensive to do water mains renewal most definitely than here in some of our cities in Australia because it mean more traffic management, it would mean more asset uh, footpaths and roads are impacted. Um, it probably also be an impact on some of the local areas and buildings. So I would expect that high density would be more naturally correlated with cost of mains replacement. I think there was a question earlier around pressure drop as well, which I didn't was answer. It? Yeah, um, I think it might have been uh, from Addy. And what I will say is. We had businesses here in Australia that was thinking that a 50 to 60 metre pressure drop was big. When we got to the UK, the Yorkshire was experiencing in some spots 80 to 90 metres of pressure differential. So there were some big differences in the UK compared to Australia. And so was it, um, was it quite an eye opener for some of the utilities to see how, uh, what, think, what things were being done in, in other parts of the world or other utilities? Yes, it was. Um, it's a good question because when you look at the losses results in their, their, their brutal form, you, you see that the UK has got more than double the leakage of Australia. So what would, what would the Australians have to learn from this program? But the big learnings were, as I explained, that the UK is very much into sweating the asset. And so that's playing out in terms of uh, lots and lots of investment in pressure and active leakage control sensors and technology. The Australians saw that as a huge, huge learning compared to what we're currently doing now. If I look at the UK, their learnings were predominantly from the way we use customers and the way we engage with customers around leakage management. So the way we create portals and different channels for them to report leakage really easily and to be involved in it. That was a learning for the UK. The way that the speed and the quality in which we do repairs, which as I said, is highly contingent around the way that we prioritize our work, a little bit around the way our crews are set up and the way our traffic management processes work and our asset access, access regime works. And that was certainly a big learning for Thames Water, I know that. And in the last pillar asset management, well, that in a way confirmed what the UK has been saying to their regulator for a long time. We've got really old assets with really poor material. So that was a win for them. But the fact that we're spending a lot more time and effort and money on renewals than them was also a major learning because it showed them that they needed to work harder at justifying their renewal expenditure to both their boards and their regulator. Okay, well, thank you very much, Paul. That was a very good uh, webinar and some uh, good questions from everybody. So uh, I'll stop the recording now, thank you. Thank you.